ever been upset with God? Have you ever questioned God? Have you ever wondered, God, why do I keep praying and you're not listening? Why are you allowing this situation? Why do you let this co-worker who's mean and conniving and, and playing politics, why do you let them succeed? Or why did you allow this to happen to my family? Where are you? Are you doing anything? And do you even care? Have you ever felt that way? Maybe it's hard to admit that in, in church, but I think most of us have probably felt that way. And today we're going to look at a prophet in the Bible who felt that way, who had these kind of questions. God, where are you? How come I keep crying out and you're not doing anything? I cry out to you and it's, they're silent. How can you allow this? This is the beginning of his prayer. Oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear or cry to you violence and you will not save? Just in this one verse, we can sense the frustration. Have you been in that place? Can you identify with Habakkuk? Today, this sermon is going to be a little bit different than normal. Normally, you know, I have three points and a lot of illustrations. And today, we're, just going to, we're actually going to walk through the whole book of Habakkuk. It's only three chapters, so that's good. Don't worry, this is not going to be a long sermon. The, the sound team knows in 35 minutes they're up on stage. It's, it's going to end, don't worry. But we're going to be walking through Scripture. And what I want to do today is, is different. I want to just let Scripture speak to us. And I'll make some comments, but I just want to point out what it's saying. And then at the end, I'm going to make very brief application. And so let's walk through this. Now, the first thing you got to know about Habakkuk is he was a prophet in Jerusalem. And he saw the violence. At that time, the city was full of oppression, the rich oppressing the poor, people uh, taking advantage of orphans, of widows. There was no justice in the courts. Evil was rampant. There was idolatry, sexual immorality. It was a wicked place, a wicked city, and Habakkuk is passionate for God, and he's passionate for what's right, and he's been praying about this and lifting this up to the Lord, and this is his prayer. Finally, he's had enough. God, I've seen enough. How long do I need to cry out for help, but you don't listen? Violence, and you do not save. Verse 3 must I forever see these evil deeds? Why must I watch all this misery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I'm surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. The law has become paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice is perverted. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever looked at what's going on in your nation, your home nation, and said, how can this be? How can there be so much division, destruction, evil? How can the nation continue to keep doing this? And God, it's like you don't even care. This is where Habakkuk is. You know, this is a pretty serious prayer, isn't it? God, I cry out and you don't listen. I cry out and you do nothing. How do you think God is going to respond to that? How would your boss respond to that? Have you ever had that meeting with your boss? There's chaos everywhere and you do nothing. How would he respond or she respond? How would your father respond if, if it was the home and, and you said, Dad, there's this and this and this and you do nothing? How would your father respond? How would your boss 
respond? How do you think God is going to respond to these allegations? Well, let's look. Let's keep walking through the text. The Lord replied, Look around at the nations. Look and be amazed. For I am... Uh, and Sorry, I'm reading a, a different version. Look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. Next. For behold, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own, Their dreaded and fearsome, their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. They all come for violence, all their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff, at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. Then they sweep by like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose own might is their God. It's not quite the response Habakkuk was looking for. But what is God saying? He's saying, Habakkuk, I hear you. I hear that you see violence is everywhere. I hear you that you see there's no justice. And so I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to send the Babylonians here. The language that God uses, they're cruel and violent. They're like leopards. They're swifter than leopards. They're more fierce than wolves. They swoop in like eagles. It is this, the violent attack. Nobody can stand against them. They laugh at kings and rulers. They laugh at fortresses. They're like the wind. They come by and they destroy and then they just keep moving on. Now, to put this in perspective, this would be a little bit like someone lamenting about the violence in America and the injustice in the U.S., crying out to God and say, God, how can you allow this to continue? And God says, I am going to raise up ISIS, and they will sweep through the United States. They are a God unto themselves, and they will be like the wind, destroy and move on. Imagine getting that response. How, how would you feel if you were crying out about injustice and then God says, I've raised up ISIS to sweep through? Or I've raised up North Korea to destroy? Or I've raised up another nation? What would your response be? Before, you're saying, God, you're not doing anything, and now God tells you what he's going to do, and it's terrifying. Habakkuk can't believe this. And so he responds, and basically his answer, if I were to paraphrase it, Serene, go ahead to the next. God, are you kidding me? That makes no sense. Your answer is to let evil people punish us? This is his response. We'll read it through. But he's basically saying, God, I cannot believe this. How can this be? How can you let that happen? So he's gone from God, you are doing nothing, to God, what you are going to do makes absolutely no sense and isn't right. But let's see how Habakkuk says it. Oh, Lord, my God. My holy one, you are eternal. Surely you don't plan to wipe us out. Oh, Lord, our rock, you've sent these Babylonians to correct us, to punish us for our many sins. But you are pure, and you can't stand the sight of evil. Will you wink at their treachery? Should you be silent while the wicked swallow up people more righteous than they? Are we only fish to be caught and killed? Are we only sea creatures that have no leader? 
Must we be strung up on their hooks and caught in their nets while they rejoice and celebrate? And then they worship their nets and burn incense in front of them. These nets are the gods who've made us rich, they will claim. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? God's answer makes absolutely no sense to Habakkuk. God, you're pure, you're holy. How can you take someone who is more evil than us and use them to punish us? He says, am I basically, are we just fish? Did you create us and just leave us like fish? The big fish eat the little fish, the bigger fish eat the, the big fish, and then the fishermen come and they just do whatever they want? Are you just going to let these evil people keep destroying nation after nation as if you don't care? Will you let this go on forever? We can relate to that, right? If God said, I'm going to raise up this terrorist organization to destroy your nation, God, how can, how can that be? How could you do that? It's important to note that God is not offended by these questions. God is not troubled by Habakkuk's honesty. In fact, he responds. He meets him where he's at. He meets him in his questions. He meets him in his doubts. He meets him in the, God, this makes absolutely no sense. Why would you run the world this way? How can this be? Are, do we matter as little to you as fish in the sea? God responds. Well, Habakkuk in verse 1, chapter 2, if you have your Bible open, you can just Walk through this with us. You know, I I think that's helpful. Chapter 2, I will climb up to my watchtower and stand at my guard post. There I will wait and see what the Lord says and how he will answer my complaint. Which I I hope we all feel that way. What is God going to say to this? Because Habakkuk raises some valid points. What what is God going to say? How is he going to respond? Chapter 2. Verse 2, the Lord said to me, write my answer plainly on tablets so that a runner can carry the correct message to others. This vision is for a future time. It describes the end and it will be fulfilled. If it seems slow in coming, wait patiently for it will surely take place. It will not be delayed. So God, if we can go back to that, just a second. Let's, let's hang on verse, that verse. Serene, if you go back one slide. Verse 2 and 3. Write my answer plainly. So God is saying, hey, let's, let's make this clear. I'm going to make it very clear what my plan is, and I want people to know. I also want you to know, Habakkuk, I'm going to do it in my time. Habakkuk wants it in his time. He wants God to answer him now. He wants things immediately. And God is saying, Habakkuk, I've got a plan. And I'm going to do it this way. And I'm going to do it in my time. And I want everybody to be clear about what I'm going to do. And you may feel like I'm slow, but it's coming. And then he tells us what's coming. So verse 4. Look at the proud. They trust in themselves and their lives are crooked. But the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. God is saying, I see what's going on. I see the wicked and I see the righteous. And now he's going to tell us how he's going to deal with the wicked. Next slide. Wealth is treacherous and the arrogant are never at rest. They open their mouths as wide as the grave. And like death, they're never satisfied. In their greed, they have gathered up many nations and swallowed many peoples. He sees the wickedness. But 
soon their captives will taunt them. So God is saying, yes, I'm allowing this to happen, but things are going to turn. It says, what sorrow awaits you thieves? Now you will get what you've deserved. You've become rich by extortion. But how much longer can this go on? Suddenly your debtors will take action. They'll turn on you and take all you have while you stand trembling and helpless. Because you have plundered many nations, now all the survivors will plunder you. You committed murder throughout the countryside and filled the towns with violence. I want to encourage you here because we're going through a lot of scripture and it'd be very easy to start to drift and to say, what is going on? Because this is very different than the way I normally preach isn't it? But what we're doing is we're walking through scripture and we're answering, we're looking at how does God answer the question of you're not doing anything, you're unjust, Lord, you don't care, are we just helpless and and you're doing nothing? These are questions that we all wrestle with and God has given us scripture to reveal his character. And so even though we're walking through it and it might seem like, oh, this is so much, this language is hard for me to understand, I want to encourage you to hang in there and to say, this is God speaking to us about how he deals with the problem of evil. So he's saying he's going to turn it on the head, bring it back on them. The next verse, he says, what sorrow awaits you who build big houses With money gained dishonestly, you believe your wealth will buy security, putting your family's nest beyond the reach of danger. But by the murders you committed, you have shamed your name and forfeited your lives. The very stones in the walls cry out against you, and the beams in the ceilings echo the complaint. In Habakkuk's day, the wealthy had power. And they could swoop down and take from the poor. And the court, they could bribe just the courts, the judges. And so they could take great advantage of the poor. They could take what belonged to the poor to build their own house. And we can look at things like that, and, and maybe you feel that way. Someone has swooped in and taken advantage of you. That Someone swooped in and exploited a, a legal loophole and, and took something that should have been rightfully yours to gain wealth. This happens. The poor, the strong, or the, the strong and the wealthy mistreat the poor, take advantage of the system to build up their own houses, and God says, look, the beams of their house cry out to me. I see it. I see it. You can't be violent and get away with it. You can't oppress the poor and get away with it. You can't steal from someone and get away with it. The very beams of the house cry out to God. Next verse. What sorrow awaits you who build cities with money gained through murder and corruption? Has not the Lord of heaven's army promised that the wealth of nations will turn to ashes? They work so hard, but all in vain. This is on a whole nother level. Those who run the nations, who build cities, who take from others in order to advance their own personal Wealth, God is saying it's going to turn to ashes. Then he takes a break. He says, For as the waters fill the sea, the earth will be filled with an awareness of the glory of God. Just evil, injustice will not prevail. It is determined that the, the earth will see the glory of God. This reminder that there's hope. This reminder that God is involved. This reminder that God is in control. In the next verse. What sorrow awaits you who make your neighbors drunk. You force your cup on them so you can gloat over their shameful nakedness. But soon it will be your turn to be disgraced. Come and drink and be exposed. Drink from the cup of the Lord's judgment. And all your glory will be turned to shame. Next. 
You cut down the forests of Lebanon. You will be cut down. You destroyed the wild animals, so now their terror will be yours. You committed murder throughout the countryside and filled the towns with violence. God is aware of all their sins and all their wickedness and all their evil. And even though it seems that he is slow in coming, he's coming. And he has determined how he will act. Habakkuk is saying, God, are we just like fish in the sea and you don't care? No. God's in control. God is going to act. And then the next part, he goes on and and says, what good is an idol carved by man or a cast image that deceives you? How foolish to trust in your own creation, a God that can't even talk. What sorrow awaits you who say to wooden idols, wake up and save us, to speechless stone images who say, rise up and teach us. Can an idol tell you what to do? They may be overlaid with gold and silver, but they're lifeless inside. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before Habakkuk's response to this is awe. Before he was questioning God. He was doubting God. He's angry with God. He's wondering, how could you do it this way? How could you act in this way? And then God gives him more information. And Habakkuk steps back. And he says, I'm filled with awe. I've heard all about you, Lord. I'm filled with awe by your amazing works. In this time of our deep need, help us again as you did in years gone by. And in your anger, remember mercy. Have you ever had half a story? Have you ever had only partial information? And responded as if it was the whole story. Maybe it was your spouse was late for something. And they missed it. And you didn't, you know, they they didn't communicate with you why. And you show up, they show up 30 minutes late. and, And you just burst in. I can't believe you're late. I can't believe you did this. You don't care about me. How could you do this? Blah, blah, blah. You know, it goes on, goes on, goes on. And then you finally calm down and your spouse says, on the way here, there was a car accident right in front of me and I had to get out and help the person get out of the car and administer first aid until the medics came. And you're like, oh, sorry. Have you ever done that with partial information? You see, when we have partial information like Habakkuk, we may see certain things. Say, God, you're silent. God, you're doing nothing. How can you let this happen in my life? I can't believe that you would do this That's where Habakkuk was, but then God gave Habakkuk more information, more revelation. And suddenly Habakkuk now understands God and what he's doing. And instead of being angry and untrusting and not believing what God is doing, he takes a step back and he's in awe. And he's no longer accusing God. He's no longer questioning God. His his posture has totally shifted. I'm filled with awe. In your wrath, remember mercy. God then gives him further information. He gives him a glimpse of his glory, his power, his salvation. Habakkuk begins to tell us what he sees in this vision. 
He says, I see God moving across the deserts from Edom, the Holy One coming across Mount Paran. His brilliant splendor fills the heavens and the earth is filled with his praise. His coming is as brilliant as the sunrise. Rays of light flash from his hand where his awesome power is hidden. Pestilence marches before him. Plague follows close behind. When he stops, the earth shakes. When he looks, the nations tremble. He shatters the everlasting mountains and levels the eternal hills. He is the eternal one. This is an overwhelming picture of God's power and glory. Habakkuk doesn't even have the language. All he can do is compare it to the biggest things we know. Mountains and hills, the sun and the moon, pestilence and plague. It is an overwhelming vision that he's just trying to somehow put into language the awesome glory and power that he sees. God reveals himself his character, his power. And then he reveals what he's going to do. He gives Habakkuk further information about what is coming. And Habakkuk says, was it in anger? Or I see the people of Cush in distress and the nation of Midian trembling in terror. Was it in anger, Lord, that you struck the rivers and parted the sea? Were you displeased with them? No, no. You were sending your chariots of salvation. You brandished your bow and your quiver of arrows. You split open the earth with flowing rivers. The nations trembled. Onward swept the raging waters. The mighty deep cried out, lifting its hands to the Lord. The sun and the moon stood still in the sky as your brilliant arrows flew and your glittering spear flashed. God is rescuing His people. You marched across the land in anger and trampled the nations in your fury. You went out to rescue your chosen people, to save your anointed ones. You crushed the heads of the wicked and stripped their bones from head to toe. With his own weapons, you destroyed the chief of those who rushed out like a whirlwind, thinking Israel would be easy prey. You trampled the sea with your horses and the mighty waters piled high. This is total and complete salvation, total rescue. Those who were oppressive are now the ones who are judged. Habakkuk sees all of this. And he was in awe, and now he's terrified. He says, I trembled when I heard this. My lips quivered with fear. My legs gave way beneath me, and I shook in terror. I will wait quietly for the coming day when disaster will strike the people who will invade us. Do you see how revelation from God changed Habakkuk's attitude. At the beginning, he's angry. At the beginning, he's accusing. He's making these accusations at God. He's saying, you want, you don't do anything. You see it and nothing. You don't listen. You don't hear us. You don't save us. And now you're going to use evil people to punish us. You don't care about us, God. And then as God gives him more and more revelation... His posture changes, he's in awe, and then he realizes who he is before God. I tremble before the Lord, that he is the Holy One. He is the God over all things. He is eternal and everlasting, and no one can stand against him. But God also showed in that, I will rescue I will deliver. And it may seem slow to you. It may not be the timing that you want, but I will do it. So now that Habakkuk has a fuller picture of what's going on, he makes a choice. The circumstances have not changed. There's still violence everywhere. 
there's still people mistreating, there's still injustice. The circumstances in his life have not changed at all. The only thing that has changed is his revelation and understanding of who God is and what God is doing and what God will do. And so he says this, even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. Even though I am facing total financial disaster, even though evil is going to sweep over this nation, I choose to rejoice. I choose to trust. I choose to hope in God. Most of us are not dealing with issues to the level of Habakkuk. But many of us have problems in our lives where we're wondering, God, where are you and why don't you care and you're not doing anything? And I pray to you again and again and I give to the church and I give offerings and I come into this place and I worship you. And it's like you're not even listening. And it may be a relationship that isn't changing. It may be a job opportunity that, that just keeps closing and slipping through your fingers it could be uh, someone who's taken something away from you, someone who's stolen from you or from your business or a decision someone else made that brought pain into your life. It may be a child who's out in the wilds and you're wondering, God, no matter how I pray, this child does not come back to me or this man does not come back. This, this woman, this daughter of mine does not come back. We wrestle with it on that level for sure. And so we have to make a choice. We each have to make a choice when we're faced with these difficult questions. Are we going to stand as God's accuser? You don't do anything and you don't help me. Where are you? And we've all been in that place. And God is not angry at Habakkuk for asking those questions. But if we stay in that place, it's the path of bitterness. If we stay in the place of accusation, it is the false path. Because God has far more information about the situation that we do. And God is far more committed to justice than we are, and God is far more loving than we are, and God is far more powerful and committed to what is right than we are. We need to shift like Habakkuk did and make the choice that God, I will choose to rejoice. That's the choice to hope. It's the choice to trust. It's the choice to believe that God is good. It's the choice to believe that God is faithful. It's the choice to believe that God will make things right in his time. It's the choice to believe that I can trust him to be with me. I can trust him to help me. I can trust him to walk me through this. I will rejoice in his faithfulness. I will rejoice in his tender mercies. I will rejoice in his forgiveness. I will rejoice in his kindness. I will celebrate his love for me. I will celebrate his faithfulness to me. It's a choice. Verse 19, the sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, able to tread upon the heights. In this, God did not promise Habakkuk any change in his circumstances. God did not explain his reasons. He did not say, Habakkuk, let me tell you why. I'm waiting. 
Let me tell you why I'm using the Babylonians. Let me tell you why I'm going to do it this way. He doesn't explain the why at all. Because God doesn't have to explain the why. If he wants to, he can, but we have no right to demand that God explain why he does something. He makes no promise to Habakkuk that your life is going to be comfortable and I'll make it easy for you because you are righteous. Habakkuk is a righteous man in an unrighteous nation. The people around him are the ones who are violent. The people around him are the ones who are wicked. And Habakkuk is swept up in their circumstances. God makes no promise that I'll make life easy for you, Habakkuk, because you honor me. But Habakkuk says this, the sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer. Now, that word deer can also refer to an ibex. And uh, one of the things I like to do with my boys is watch BBC nature documentaries. And they have one called The Hunt. And it's about animals that are being hunted and the escapes and the attacks. And you might wonder, is that okay for a two-year-old to watch? And uh, we'll, we'll find out later. <laughs> But uh, one, of, one, of the, one of the scenes, segments, was about the ibex in Israel. It's kind of a goat, and uh, it lives on the cliffs, and it's hunted by foxes. But it, it can move on what appears to us to be almost a sheer cliff. It has the ability to go up and down, where if you and I were on that cliff, we would die we wouldn't be able to make it. But the deer, the goat, the ibex can make it over this rough terrain. Life is rough. Life is hard. Life is painful. There are evil people around us. There are people who will mistreat us. There are people who will make poor decisions that impact us in our workplace, in our family, in our community, in our nation. And God doesn't promise to fix it all now. But what Habakkuk sees is God is my strength and he will enable me to make it through it. He will show me where to put my feet. He will lead me through the circumstances. I'm going to make it. That's the choice we have to make to believe. I'm going to make it. God is going to help me make it. I'm going to choose to rejoice in Him. I'm going to choose. To believe I'm not a victim. I'm victorious in Christ. I'm not captive to my circumstances. I'm free in Christ. I'm not a slave to what's going on around me. I'm, I'm not uh, like a kite in the wind. I am strong in the Lord. And he may not change the diagnosis. He may not change your boss. He may not change the circumstances in your finances, but he will give you the ability to walk through it without falling off the cliff. And he's big enough and he's great enough and he's good enough that we can walk through the tough circumstances in life with joy. Not joy that's dependent on the people around us or the amount of money in our bank account, but joy that is rooted and grounded in the goodness of God, in the hope we have in Christ, in the love of our Savior. And it's a choice we have to make. Because we all have questions like Habakkuk. 
We all have the same issues. We all have the same temptations where we look up at God and say, what are you doing? Where are you? And why aren't you listening to me? And we all have the choice. Am I going to stay like this? Or am I going to turn like this and worship and trust? You're the only one who can make that choice. You're the only one who can make that choice. And God is faithful and good regardless of the choice you make. God loves you and cares for you regardless of your choice because you didn't choose God, he chose you. He was the one who pursued you. He was the one who adopted you. He is the one who welcomed you and loves you. And he'll be faithful even if you think he's not faithful. And he will be good, even if you think he's not good. And he will care and provide for you, even if you think he won't. You have the power to make the choice. How you're going to walk through the hardships and difficulties of this life. You have the power to make that choice. Let's pray. Father, you are good. You are so good to us. And Lord, I know that many of us right now are wrestling with these questions in our hearts. And I thank you that you don't despise us, that you're not angry with us for having these questions. I thank you that we can pray honestly to you. And so, Lord, as, as we prepare to take communion, as, as we remember how committed you are to us, I pray that you would help us to make the choice to rejoice in you, to make the choice to trust you, to make the choice to believe that you will be our strength and you will help us walk through these circumstances. In Jesus' name. Amen.